now. So I'd like to welcome all our participants and our speakers uh, to this evening's uh, uh, Food and Health uh, public lecture. Uh, my name is Claire Korsh. I'm Professor of Clinical Nutrition and Dietetics here in UCD. And the focus of this evening's lecture is on sustainable food, agriculture and diet aspects. And I'm delighted to welcome our two speakers. Uh, firstly, we have Professor uh, Kevin MacDonnell, and Professor MacDonnell has a joint appointment here in UCD across crop science and biosystems engineering. His specialist interdisciplinary area of agri is agricultural systems technology, which addresses the sustainable use of bioresources with a global perspective. He has collaborated widely on European research projects and currently coordinates the European Horizon 2020 Farm for More project. Professor MacDonald has published over 160 peer-reviewed papers and has worked with Consult UCD to support many companies, including startup companies. Prior to joining UCD, Professor MacDonald was an inspector with the Environmental Protection Agency. So, Professor MacDonald is going to start tonight and then be joined by uh, Assistant Professor Afric O'Sullivan, whom again, I'm delighted to welcome. And Afric is an Assistant Professor, as I said, in the UCD School of Agriculture and Food Science, of, of Agriculture and Food Science. She's also a lead research scientist with the Institute of Food and Health, Health and Deputy Vice Principal for International Affairs in the College of Agriculture and Health Sciences. Uh, Dr. O'Sullivan's research explores the interactions between genes, environment, diet, and our metabolism. And the aim of her research is to provide evidence that informs healthy, sustainable nutrition strategies. One key aspect of which is her research that is really trying to foster the transition to sustainable, healthy diets. Dr. O'Sullivan is also has a leading role in the UCD Childhood and Human Development Research Centre, the Royal Irish Academy and the European Academy Science Advisory Council. And she moreover, she sits on the editorial board for three nutrition journals and is an active member of several scientific nutrition um, uh, organizations. I am delighted to welcome both Kevin and Afric to speak to you this evening, and I'll hand over to Kevin now. Uh, thank you very much. So just thank you everybody for joining with us this evening. Um, and I thought it might be useful for us to talk a little bit about sustainable agriculture and the role that it's going to be playing in how we're going to get our food in the future and really where our food is going to be coming from. So in that regard, if you think about some of the challenges that we're facing currently at the moment, so the population is continuing to expand and hence there will be a demand, an ongoing demand for us to provide safe, nutritious and sustainable food for that population. So we've got to figure out how we will do this in a sustainable way. We've got to consider the resources that we will use for doing it. And we've got to make the entire food system far more inclusive and far more resilient. We have seen the shocks to the system from COVID. We've seen shocks to the system from the war in Ukraine. And we need to know how we can develop more sustainable systems and more inclusive systems to deal with that. The challenge specifically from an agricultural point of view is to try and understand how could we increase this agricultural production while at the same time trying to reduce the amount of chemical inputs, we have more and more stricter regu regulation coming from the European Union with regard to the types of inputs that we can use. But in addition, we're also losing land resources because as the population grows, there's a greater demand for housing, there's a greater demand for infrastructure, everything from transport to power stations to the networks that we use for uh, communications. And all of these take up the footprint. And hence that reduces the amount of land base that we have available for growing crops or for producing food from. Hence, we need to understand how we can produce more food from a smaller land base and also from diminishing water resources, because agriculture tends to use quite a significant amount of our water resources. Now, a lot of it gets recycled back through the system, but we just need to be careful how we're using that water going forward. 
So some of the additional challenges that we have to try and address will deal around changes in weather patterns. We're seeing more droughts, we're seeing more stress, and that's regarding how we produce plants, be they for human diet or be they for animal diets. So we're constantly having to try and understand, given these shorter working windows, how do we produce more from less? And when we're faced with challenges like that, and when there's a, a difficulty with regarding to making decisions, the best way that we can approach these challenges is to try and incorporate more decisions, more data, more effectively. So we're looking at ways of incorporating better data sources to make better decisions using more analytics and more algorithms about making those decisions. Thing about uh, these decisions, these decision-making tools is the digital tools, they're, they're simply a tool, just like a hammer. And if we don't have a purpose or we don't have an objective for it, it won't help us achieve our outcome. So as the decisions are getting more complicated, we need to understand, could we make better decisions if we understood more of the problems and if we could have better information as we make each decision, could we actually make a better decision? So to explain that, we'll take it through an, ex an example. So if I want to grow a wheat crop, I'm thinking about what wheat crop I could grow. I have a particular location that I could grow it. My starting point, I have to search the databases on the Department of Agriculture to look at what are the approved varieties and the availability of those varieties from, for example, seed merchants. So I need to think about what should the variety be. But I also need that to link that to my soil characteristics. I need to understand the soil texture. I need to understand the types of soils that I have. For example, some varieties are more suitable to alkaline soils than acidic soils. Some varieties are very susceptible to waterlogging. Hence, I need to understand how my soils are behaving. I also need to link that to how I'm going to establish my crop. So what decision will I make with regard to the establishment technology? Again, different varieties, different crops will germinate more successfully with a different establishment technique. So, for example, full conversion technique, a plow-based sowing system versus a zero-till system. Not all varieties are suitable to germinating under a zero-till system. So, again, I need to link all these parts of my production system. I absolutely need to link it to localized weather data. And this is where it becomes really important to understand about local weather, because the local weather will, un will influence your soils. And that will have a greater influence on how your particular variety will do on your soils in your condition and in your location. We tend to use national weather statistics, but they're very generic. We actually need much more localized site-specific data, and not just for today and tomorrow. We need historical records going back a decade or more so that we can look at changing patterns within a particular location. Because that will influence how, for example, my wheat variety is going to do in that particular field. But more importantly, it will influence your decisions from a management point of view. Because then you can start to understand, well, there's one field that has a heavy clay content. I know that from my soil results. Hence, in the winter, I need to sow that field early because it will get waterlogged quite quickly. And again, in the spring, I know my weather patterns. I know it will be slow to warm up. Hence, that variety will be behind the curve if I sow it in a, a cold, wet soil. I might think about sowing a different variety there because I need a variety that can germinate more quickly in a cold and wet soil. And these are very specific decisions that we need to be able to make because they will influence the entire spectrum of how that plant is going to behave. And it's dealing with our production systems on a specific field and a within-field scenario. And that enables us to be much more sustainable about how we manage our resources. And the big resource that we're really trying to manage is our soils and how sustainable are our soils and how can we manage them to maximize the output. What we have seen is that far, there's a very significant amount of soils across Europe, but globally as well, that are becoming more and more degraded. The big issue really revolves around changing weather patterns because as, as weather patterns change, soils are more vulnerable to compaction. You can see an example in the picture on the left of a compacted soil where the ruts from the tires are very clearly visible. And as equipment has gotten heavier and heavier over the years, we're running the risk of doing more damage to our soils. Now, if we compress our soils, if we over compact them, they're not going to be as sustainable. They're not going to be as healthy. And that means we have a lot more difficulty with how we produce crops and viable crops from those soils, because if we damage them, we have to find out how we remediate it and remove the damage from the soils. 
But as farming enterprises have expanded, so too has the size of the equipment that we're using. And there's a really significant issue with the lack of skilled labor in agriculture. Hence, machinery has gotten wider and larger to deal with more work by one operator in a shorter window. So we're compounding the problem. We have soils that are at a higher risk of compaction and hence losing their biological health. But we're running into difficulties. We've not been able to get labor to manage our soils in a more timely manner. So we have a difficulty with regard to how we produce our food in a more sustainable manner while preserving the health of our soils. We're trying a range of experiments here in the university to see how we might address some of these challenges. So we're looking at different establishment techniques. We're looking at different equipment that could be used for establishing them. We're looking at maybe reducing tire pressures or we're looking at more trafficking patterns within the soil. We're looking at changing weather windows. So we're sowing it in conditions that are a little bit more marginal than mainstream. And we're seeing how different cultivation systems might survive. It's to try and forward predict a little bit about how the weather patterns might influence our sowing windows. We're doing more scanning of soils to again, understand the soil texture, the soil structure, what's happening to those soils. So when we establish our plots, we take cores from them. So we put the plants in. And a key part of what we do with, with our crops is we, we walk the crops continually. But when you walk a crop, what you're doing is you're assessing the above ground biomass. And we make an awful lot of decisions on what the above ground biomass is looking like. We also need to consider the below ground biomass. So what we're doing is we're taking cores, we're taking samples, we're scanning them with a CT scanner in the same way you would if you went into a hospital to take a look at an injury or an impact of, for example, a, a damaged arm or a damaged leg, you might get a CT scan to see what the damage is. We're using the same technology to look at how the roots are behaving because about 50% of the plant's energy is going into the root architecture. If you pull a plant out of the soil, you lose all that information about how the roots were structured, how were they moving to the soil. So by scanning them, we get a much better idea as to how the roots are behaving. Are they exploring the soil? Is there something there in the compaction of the soil that is stopping them from exploring the soil? Are they getting access to water? Are they getting access to nutrients? So looking at how those plants behave throughout the season is giving us a much better idea about the importance of, for example, soil moisture particularly as we're getting more and more drought windows where, we're, where our plants are struggling uh, to try and carry on growing during those windows, we're looking to see how the plants are growing. And what we're seeing over a number of years, we started doing this in 2019 and we have up to 2023, we're looking how the different cultivation systems are releasing water back to the plants during those really critical uh, yield building months for grass and for cereals throughout May, June, and July. And what we're seeing in particular, that the different cultivation systems can enable roots to go deeper into the soil to find moisture, which means the plants aren't struggling. They're much more sustainable because the soil is a lot healthier. We're able to manage them much more effectively. And even later on in the growing season, just around about the time of harvest, we're seeing how the different cultivation systems allow those soils to re-wet, and if they re-wet too much close to the time of harvest, we run the risk of a lot more damage being done to those soils. So we want to try and minimize that. So we're seeing how we could build, for example, more decision tools around managing nitrogen, as an example, within our crops. It's one of the key uh, ingredients or the key nutrients that we use to produce healthy crops. And typically, we could scan in real time and look at how the crops are doing and look at the nitrogen associated with it. But that's very much reactive. And what we're trying to be is much more proactive and look to see, could we integrate more data points around the system to help build a much more informed decision-making system about the data regarding the availability of nitrogen, the data, avail the data regarding how those plants are responding to it. And there are lots of companies in these space. Agricultural data is incredibly valuable. There are literally thousands of companies offering a service. But what we're trying to do is to see, well, how could we join the data systems that they're using? So there's no common protocol. Could we look at more data sharing systems to see, could we build a better understanding of how our soils are doing? And from that, the health status of the soils. So one of the key points around our decisions are, how we preserve the health in the soils? And a lot of that is to do with organic matter or organic carbon in the soils. There's twice as much carbon in soils as there are in air. We have a lot of legislation about environmental emissions. We really need to see how we manage our carbon in the soils because that builds a healthy soil. And if we build a healthy soil, that links to healthy plants and to healthy diets, both for humans and for animals as well. So some of the 
technologies that we're looking at is how do we cultivate our soils? How do we keep our soils covered to prevent carbon losses associated with it? Issues regarding the role of different crops, uh, protein crops, cereal crops within the rotation, grass in the rotation. How do we do that in such a way that we can improve the soil health and the soil biology associated with it? And that also includes the integration of livestock into above and below ground biomass and to see how we manage it because the, the key goal is to produce a healthy soil because that makes it far more sustainable from an agricultural production point of view. So healthy soils links us to healthy plants and that links us very nicely to healthy diets. So on that point, I will stop sharing and I'll hand you over to Afrik, who will take it from there. Thanks, Kevin. I hope everybody can hear me and thank you to everybody for joining this evening. So I'm just going to share my slides. And while Afrik is doing that, can I just remind you all to put your questions for both speakers into the Q&A section, please. And uh, because part of uh, these uh, talks is not only to give you good evidence-based information, but also to take and try and answer the questions that you might have. Uh, sorry, Afric, thanks a million now if you have your slides up. Oh, yeah. well. Sorry, did that, the, did that chair for me? It wasn't coming up. Yeah, the chair, yeah, yeah, the chair for you. Okay. Sorry about that, I will do that yes. again in one second. Just, okay, so Q and A's please, while Africa is sharing her slides. Here we go. Thank you. All right. So it's uh, one second. There we go. It's not really playing ball for me here. One second. Sorry. Um, we can, okay. We can see Africa. Okay, that's fine. I'll I'll keep going and hope that it uh, it behaves as we go along. I'm gonna have to just move my screen down a little bit. I'm sorry. So. Just to kind of pick up where Kevin left off, I suppose he talked through a lot of the pressures that are on the world today that are having an impact on our environment. And so we need to start to think about how we can produce foods, but also how we can consume foods in a more sustainable way. So the real important point here, and without repeating anything that Kevin has already said, is that we really do need to take a sustainable food system approach as we look at the future of how we're producing and consuming foods. And what that means is essentially we're not just thinking about kind of how we produce foods, but also how we transport foods, how we manufacture or package foods, and then ultimately the types of foods that we're eating. And then also keeping in mind that all of these things interact with each other. So if we change one thing in that food system, it could have a positive or negative effect on all of the other components. And that's really important to remember uh, as we kind of approach changing foods and changing diets. Okay. It's not changing for me, one second. Yeah, there we go, okay. So briefly, just as I said, I'm taking the kind of other side of the, the scale approach here and looking at how we can be more sustainable in the foods that we eat or, or in our dietary behaviors as well. So I'm gonna talk you just very briefly through the overview of what I'm gonna talk about. I'm first gonna introduce how we measure the environmental impact of foods. Then I'm gonna look at some definitions for what a sustainable healthy diet is. I'm gonna think about then, well, what would that look like for Ireland or how do we compare to what that definition looks like and what would that mean from a nutrition and health perspective? And then I'm lastly gonna finish off with a little bit on what we're doing here in UCD with respect to sustainable healthy diets. Okay. All right, this is, uh, sorry, now my slides are slow. There you go. Okay. So the first thing I mentioned, I'm going to talk you through a couple of the measurements that we use to kind of determine how much impact certain foods have on the environment. So looking at the left hand side here, um, you can see there's certain foods listed. So starting at the top of that table on the left, you have things like peas and beans and nuts. And on the bottom of the table, you have things like sheep meat and beef meat. And really all I want to show you is one of the measurements that we often talk about is greenhouse gas emissions. And what that means is any of the gases that are produced when a food is either grown, transported or consumed. And really without going into the detail on it here, it's just to give an indication that 
the greenhouse gas emissions associated with animal source foods, so things like beef meat and sheep meat, tend to be higher than the greenhouse gas emissions associated with our plant-based foods, things like beans and peas at the top of the table. That figure also gives you an indication of the land use and the water use associated with those food groups, but I'm not going to focus on that for this presentation. I'm going to stick with one metric, and that's the greenhouse gas emissions. So now to kind of the main part of this slide, a group in Chagas led by Sinead McCarthy has looked at the Irish diet um, and measured the greenhouse gas emissions associated with the foods that we eat. And what she's showing here in this table in a paper that she has published is that the top three foods in our diet that are contributing to greenhouse gas emissions are red meat and dairy and starchy staples. And before I move on, I just want to highlight that it's important to take into account not just the greenhouse gas emissions associated with those foods, but also how they contribute to our total energy intake. So, for example, starchy staples are things like bread and pasta and rice. So these are plant based foods, but we tend to eat quite a lot of them. So a big proportion of the energy that we eat will be from starchy staples relative to some of the other plant based foods. So things like legumes which are listed 16th in this table so they're at the bottom of this image okay so then what is a sustainable diet sorry <laughs> a sustainable sorry what is a sustainable diet you will have heard terms like vegan diet vegetarian diet flexitarian diet and plant-based diets and all of these terms refer to diets that are either have no animal source foods like a vegan diet or are lower in animal source foods than our typ typical omnivorous diet. But before I go into the detail of those uh, terms or what they mean, I want to actually look at what others are defining as a sustainable diet. So here I have two examples of definitions of a sustainable diet. On the left hand side, I have the Eat Lancet diet, which was one of the first kind of published definitions of a sustainable diet. On the right hand side, I have the UN Food and Agricultural Organization definition, but I've broken it down into four kind of key points. So it defines a sustainable diet as a diet that it has a low environmental impact, provides nutrition security and is healthy to life, is culturally acceptable and accessible, and is economically fair and affordable. So really important components um, that we must kind of take into account as we start to look at making changes to our diet. Sorry, next slide. Going back then to that Eat Lancet diet. So it's the one that I had the image on the left hand side. Again, I've zoomed in on that plate just so that you can get a better idea of what it is defining as a sustainable, healthy diet. And so I'm going to kind of get you to pick out the top or the three biggest segments of that plate. So that's the fruits and vegetables on the left, the whole grains at the top, and then the plant the plant sourced protein on the kind of bottom right quadrant, which altogether makes up over 75 percent of the energy recommended by this Eat Lancet diet. Next, I want you to focus on that little segment that I have highlighted in the yellow dashed line. So this is the animal source foods that the Eat Lancet diet is recommending. And if we look at that from a protein only perspective, the Eat Lancet diet is recommending that we're getting about a quarter of our protein from animal foods and about three quarters of our protein from plant based fruit foods. If we compare that to Ireland, so here's where I'm kind of trying to look and see, well, how do we compare to what some of these definitions are? Ireland, our current intake is about two thirds protein from animal source foods and one third protein from plant based. So it's almost the opposite to what this East Lancet, East Lancet diet is recommending. But what I do want to bring you back to is that UNFAO definition where we need to think about the cultural acceptability as well, and also that it's nutritionally kind of secure for everybody and is associated with a healthy life. And so that's just another key point that I'm going to highlight on my next slide. So this was another small piece of research that we did here in UCD, and it's going back to looking at some of the work that Sinead McCarthy and Chagas did. But this time I wanted to look and see, well, 
what do these foods, these top three foods, meat, dairy and starchy staples, how do they contribute to the critical micronutrients in our diet? And for this, I selected out um, children's diets in particular, because we know that children have high micronutrient or high vitamin and mineral needs relative to the total amount of food and the total amount of energy that they're consuming. So sorry, now I just have to move my screen a little bit because of it not showing properly. But basically, if we look at these three food groups, we can see that meat, dairy and starchy staples are kind of the top foods contributing to some of these critical micronutrients. So I'm just going to pick out one in particular. So if you look at meat, it's contributing the most to vitamin D intakes for children. It's the, the second biggest contributor to iron intakes, and it's the third bi biggest contributor to vitamin A intakes. And if you look at the others, dairy and starchy staples, you can see that they're ra also ranked quite highly across these different nutrients. Obviously, the dairy contributing number one to calcium intake. So while it's important, uh, really, really important to look at the environmental impact of these foods, it's also important to consider the nutrient kind of impacts of these foods. And again, particularly for what we might rank as more vulnerable population groups like children where they have high nutrient needs and maybe consuming less food. Okay, so what are we doing in UCD to look at this or to answer some of these questions? Well, we're part of a group that is again, connected with Chagask uh, University College Cork and Queen's University Belfast. And we designed a research project to essentially look and see if we make changes to diet. So if we try to implement dietary advice that would move people to a more sustainable, healthy diet, how would that impact their greenhouse gas emissions associated with their diet being the number one question, but then also looking at how it impacts their nutrient status and their health biomarkers. And so we designed a 12 week intervention study where we randomly allocated our participants. We had 360 participants all together across three sites aged between 18 and 65 and we had males and females. We randomly allocated them either to a control diet, which was essentially based on our current healthy eating guidelines or a sustainable healthy diet. And with the sustainable healthy diet, ultimately, we were trying to reduce the total amount of meat that people were eating. We kept fish the same, but the big change for people was really increasing their plant based proteins. So that's things like beans, peas, lentils, nuts and seeds. And so just to present, just, just to say we're still, we finished the data collection on this study, but we still have all of the laboratory based analysis to do. So we still need to measure the micronutrient status and some of the health biomarkers. But when we look, we did some modeling work with the dietary intake data, and we have some questionnaire data that we have used. And I'm just summarizing a couple of key things that I think here are important as we move forward towards designing diets that will get us to that kind of more sustainable healthy diet and I suppose firstly to say that our modeling shows that we can reduce diet related greenhouse gas emissions essentially and still meet the European Food Safety Authority dietary reference values for most micronutrients but in saying that we do have some nutrients of concern and the two I'm highlighting here are vitamin D and iodine and I just want to note, as well as the sustainable, healthy diet, the control group, and also when we looked at baseline intakes for this cohort, they were also low in these two nutrients. So the, for Ireland, these are really critical nutrients. Then the other kind of point that I thought was really important is that the control and the sustainable, healthy diet participants, so those that receive the dietary advice based on our current health eating guidelines, and those that received the advice where we were gearing to reduce meat and increase plant-based proteins, they reported equally that it was easy or very easy to follow the meat recommendations. So that's quite positive. But as I said, anecdotally, the feedback was that the plant-based proteins were the difficult ones. But this is actually great data to have, even for, for, for now, knowing that our participants are finding it difficult to introduce new things like the plant-based proteins, beans, nuts, seeds, and so on. As we kind of move towards making, changing dietary recommendations so that they are more sustainable, we need to build in tools and things that will help people to make that change. 
So that was one of the key important findings out of this research. We still have a bit to do, as I said, to look at the, the nutrient side of things and see whether or not the blood biomarkers were changing in response to this 12-week diet. So the last slide that I want to present is just some kind of top tips and really more so to point you towards some resources that are out there already for helping to move towards a sustainable, healthy diet. And just to highlight a couple of things that are here, the, the one I'm presenting is from the British Dietetics Association and it's their top tips for making changes. But also just to note the Irish Nutrition and Dietetic Institute published a fact sheet this year that you can get on their website. And the British Nutrition Foundation also has a fact sheet that is available. So there's lots of resources out there. As I said, just highlighting some of the key points, things like if trying to reduce your meat intake, trying to introduce or plan one or two meat-free days in the week is one kind of way to do that. Another way is to replace kind of half or even all of the meat in some of the classic recipes that you would be used to making. So things like bolognese and also curries or casseroles are good ways to try to replace some meat with kind of things like beans and lentils tend to work well in those types of dishes. Another thing that this um, fact sheet highlights is food waste, and it's not something I've talked about, but that is another way, just doing some extra planning when shopping around what kind of meals you plan to make that week and how you can use leftovers from different types of meals can really help you to reduce the amount of food wasted as well, which is really important. So this is just my very last slide and it's really just to thank the whole uh, SUHI Guide team, that's the name of the project, and in particular Katie, Ursula and Leona, who are the three PhD students that are working on that My Planet diet that I presented um, there in the last couple of slides. And thank you to again for listening. Apologies for the uh, problems with my slides. And I'll hand back over to Claire for questions.